Welcome or welcome back everyone to the 2024 Archive Space Virtual Member Forum. I'm Jessica Crouch, the Community Engagement Lead for Archive Space. We're going to go ahead and get started because we have a very full schedule this afternoon. Um, so I'm going to take care of a few housekeeping items and then we'll dive into our presentations. You can find the forum wiki, which has the agenda and other information posted in the chat in just a second. We also have several members of the forum planning team on hand that can help if you have questions about what about the forum and, and what's happening with the forum. You can leave and come back during sessions as you wish. Your connection information will remain the same. However, if you plan to attend any other sessions of the forum, you will need to have registered for that separately. So if you want to attend tomorrow's session, you can still register and you'll receive connection information for that. We are recording today's sessions and recordings will be linked in the event wiki page in the coming days. We are using Zoom webinar today and your microphone and camera are both muted. If you'd like to ask questions of a presenter, we ask that you use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We'll hold all questions for each presenter until the end of their presentation and then at that time I'll read your question out loud to the presenter for them to address. Some questions may be answered directly in the Q&A in an effort to keep the forum on schedule, so keep an eye on the Q&A for additional information and resources. If you have a general question, need some other form of assistance, or just want to chat with your fellow attendees, please feel free to reach out using the chat option at the bottom of the screen instead of the Q&A. Again, any question directed towards a presenter should be put in the Q&A, otherwise uh, your question may not be answered. Keep in mind there are many participants and attendees at this forum coming from a variety of institutions and experience levels. The Archive Space Code of Conduct applies to all Archive Space events, including virtual events. Please remember to be considerate and respectful in your interactions with your fellow attendees, presenters, forum planning team, and to the program team staff in the Q&A and chat. Now for some thank yous. First, thank you to our forum planning team. Archive Space is a community supported program and we require the input, effort and expertise of our members in all things, including in planning wonderful events like this. I'm very grateful to this year's forum planning team for soliciting presentations and developing this wonderful agenda. It speaks to the depth of expertise in our community that we have such a variety of presentations to learn from this week, but it takes time, effort, and patience to pull something like this together. So a big thank you to Alexandra McGee, Bailey Grace Harrell, Christine Liebson, Jackie Johnson, Katerina D Demetria Du schuster Regina Haberlein, and Sarit Han. And thank you to all of the presenters discussion, and discussion leaders who we'll hear from over the next two days. Each presenter will be introduced in their session, but I wanted to acknowledge them here as well. We couldn't have forums like this without engaged users willing to share their knowledge and, ex and experiences with the rest of the community. I've said this at every forum for the past several years, and I said it earlier today. Uh, it, it, we all have a lot on our plates right now, so I am deeply appreciative for each presenter dedicating the time and energy to participate in this forum. So a sincere thank you to everyone on this list. And thank you all for being here. I'm looking forward to another great session with presentations and discussions. And uh, please do feel free to chime in during the Q&As. Please connect with one another in the chat. And let's all enjoy this time learning from one another in archive space. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And Tony, if you want to go ahead and share yours while I read your introduction. Oh, am I, am I going first? Yeah, Tony, you're up okay. next. You want to go ahead no and share problem. your screen? Yeah, yeah. 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 All right. So next up, we have Tony Lattice from University of Wisconsin-Madison presenting Migrating Legacy Data to Archive Space, Lessons from a Migration Project at University of Wisconsin-Madison Archives and Records Management. This presentation will give an overview of a project to migrate legacy accession data into archive space. In the fall of 2023, University of Ma University of Wisconsin-Madison Archives executed a project to migrate a Microsoft Access database which contained 40 plus years of accession records into archive space. The project has greatly increased the usability of archive space as a mode of discovery for archive staff. This presentation will describe the process as an example of successful legacy data migration. This project included the use of Python as a way to assemble JSON data for loading with the archive space API. There should be plenty of time for questions and discussions of successes or failures with this type of migration, as well as prospective projects, regardless of technical complexity. Turning it over to you, Tony. All right. Thanks a lot. Um, so I want to talk about a migration project that I think um, that, and, and I'll talk about this in, in deeper context, but it, it emerged from 
you know, a, a need to kind of simplify the work that we were doing around the department. But I think it really changed the way that we end up using archive space at the end of the day. But um, I'll, I'll get to more of that as, as I get going. Um, uh, who am I? I'm uh, Tony Lattice. I'm a processing archivist at a large public university in the Midwestern United States. Um, I've been in my position since about uh, 2021. I'm not like a professional programmer and I don't have any like CS background or anything like that. I have messed around with Python as a hobby for a few years now. Um, but I don't really have many technical responsibilities in my job. Um, so what I'm hoping to sort of bring is the perspective of an archivist who wanted to execute something like this. Um, the project that I'm going to discuss here was executed in late 2023. I had sort of uh, arrived at the idea in late 2022, but it took a while for it to sort of come to the top of my work queue. Um, it involved the migration of about 9,000 accession records uh, into archive space and largely was a product of uh, a, a big Python script that I used to do all of this stuff. But again, I'll get into that more later. Um, so really uh since i don't have you know a huge amount of background with these types of projects um i sort of thought well you know what what can i say about this project that would be meaningful um so i want to talk about why this was a good opportunity to migrate data um what like tools that i use then what kind of skills you might need to do something similar um and a little bit about how i sort of decided on an approach to it um, I also want to talk about what I kind of learned, what my, my more general takeaways for a project like this are, so that it would be useful for someone who's maybe not going to use the same software or tools at all, but, uh, but is, wants to do a sort of similar project. And then I just wanted to touch on how this changed how we use archive space, because I think ultimately it's had a, a, a large effect. It, you know, our, our institution was a sort of late adopter of, of archive space, and, and, uh, and, and this is you know, had a pretty broad impact on, on how it's used around the department. Um, so here's my roadmap for today. I'm gonna to do an overview of the sort of origin of the document that I ended up migrating and its context and the context of the project. Um, I'll do a kind of brief summary of the technical elements of the project. I don't wanna like show a ton of code or anything. I don't know what the audience here is like. Um, if we, you know, if we want to talk about that more afterwards, I'd be happy to. Um, but I'm again, I'm not, you know, I'm not a professional programmer or anything like that, so I don't have that much to teach as far as that's concerned. Um, then I'll finish with some things that I think that I learned about uh, migrating legacy data and some things that, uh, you know, I feel like you can take away. Um, so here's my like super brief history of UW archives. We were founded in 1950 um, and had pretty standard practices at that time. Um, an important sort of era for me is uh, in the early 70s when we started having separate typed accession records. Um, by the 1980s, most processing had stopped at UW archives. Things were being given an accession number and a location. And the titles associated with those were the primary method of description for archives collections. Um, in 2000, UW archives moved about a mile across campus um, to a satellite library from the, uh, from the central library on campus. Um, this transition has never really been completed. We still have material that's over in the other library. So this obviously fragmented description and led to a lot of transition documents and stuff like that. Um, it's just sort of an important piece of context for our institution. Um, and then in 2018, uh, we implemented archive space. Um, since that time, we've tracked accessions through archive space, but that was sort of a clean break. So we have data from before that time and then data from after that time. Uh, and then in 2022, uh, we were approved to build a new shelving facility. So this means that we, we've been allocating a lot more resources towards doing processing um, and has also led to me sort of reevaluating what our uh, descriptive situation is like and how I want it to work going forward. So the, the big thing, <laughs> the context for this project is sort of descriptive fragmentation. Um, we have a guide for our reference staff to, uh, to kind of guide them in, in, in how to look for collections at UW archives. 
Um, and that guide is fairly complex. It has 19 sections and it's covering various different descriptive resources. Um, I'm sure a lot of people have similar situations to this. It's just really hard to get everything in one place, um, especially if your institution has a longer history. But like, you know, th this feels a little difficult to me. Um, and so this includes like large resources like our library's electronic catalog and some big card indexes that we have. And there's also a huge number of smaller resources the, you know, things like spreadsheets that, you know, cover one format or maybe, you know, one area or one era, Word documents that function as like subject guides or something of that nature. And then a Microsoft Access database, which I've called out specifically because that's the thing that I actually worked on for this project. Um, this is again, just some more context. You can sort of see this in the early uh, years of UW archives. This is what accession tracking looked like. You can see the entries down at the bottom in the grid of this card. Um, not much information there, not much specific information, I should say. Although I like this card a lot because the one of the titles here is History Can Be Interesting, which is the, a really strong thesis statement for your department, I think. Um, this is uh, one of the typed accession records that I was talking about before, um, which are important for me in this project. Um, as you can see up at the top that we actually have sequential accession numbers now. Um, there's a lot more data going on here, um, some indication of where you know provenance is coming from, but still sorting things into repr groups the way that um, you would classically do it. Uh, and, uh, you know, documentation of the actual event of transfer. Um, so this is what ACMaster <laughs> looked like. That was the title of this document. And ACMaster was really important for the functioning of UW archives, both, both in terms of sort of technical function and reference service. Um, it must have taken a lot of time <laughs> to get this started. Uh, and it has a lot of drawbacks. Um, but it has a ton of information in it, right? This is an accession register that 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 goes back a long way. You can see in, at the, on the left hand side that these records that I'm showing are from 1977. Um, so there was a ton of information here and a ton of access to uh, collections at UW Archives. But having them in a Microsoft Access database like this made them a little bit difficult to deal with. Um, so the sort of context for ActMaster. Uh, it's, it, it was, an, like I said, an access database. Um, it was in use from sometime in the early 90s until about 20, or until 2018, I shouldn't say about, because that's when archive space was implemented and we started tracking accessions in there instead. Um, I can't exactly pinpoint when it started, uh, but you know I know that Microsoft Access came out in the early 90s. And also if you're a keen-eyed viewer, you will know that ActMaster has eight characters in it, um, which is indicative to me of a pre-Windows 95 file name, maybe just a habit that carried over, I don't know. But that, that seems like a good uh, guess for when it started. It has about 9,000 accession events in it. Um, and the records go back to 1977. So if it started in the early 90s, but we have all these older records in it, it means that somebody went through uh, and retroactively typed thousands of records into ActMaster. And I am profoundly thankful for that labor. This project would not have been possible without it. Um, and I had to remind myself of that as I was going through and dealing with errors and ambiguities and stuff like that, that like, you know, having this made this thing possible. So I, you know, I, my deepest thanks to whoever did this. I have no idea who you are. Um, ActMaster was sort of an omnibus for our department. Um, it was functioning both as an accession register, but also for like what you might consider resource information, like shelving locations, um, record groups, titles, that's up to date stuff like that, um, which meant that it played a pretty large role um, in the function of the department. We were having to keep this thing updated in parallel with other resources. Um, it was also frequently used for discovery by reference staff. So they would do that, you know, just by opening the document and using control F, just a clunky, but, you know, reasonable way to do something like this. Um, but it has probably the broadest, I say probably because I'm not really confident in this statement about any of our discovery resources, but it probably has the 
uh, broadest coverage of any document that we were using to sort of do title searches for uh, collections at UW Archives. So it made a really, really good candidate for migration um, for these reasons. One, it was taking up a lot of time to keep it updated. And, and two, because you know there's a lot of pretty comprehensive coverage in there. So that's it for the context. Uh, I want to just give a short summary of the technical elements, kind of focusing on, on how things fit together rather than how they you know, worked at any granular kind of level. Um, the first step was just to dump ActMaster into an XLSX document. I knew that I would need to get the data out, do some manipulation on it, and then map it onto uh, you know, the, the archive space record form. Um, XLSX is not, it, there's no great reason to do it that way other than that I was already confident that I could get the open PYXL library in Python to interact with an XLSX document. So like I could have used CSV or something flat or you know maybe even figured out how to get Python to read an access database. I'm sure that's possible, but I didn't know how to do any of those things. And so as a sort of theme for this project, like it was just, what did I already know how to do? And I already knew how to do this. And also that that would avoid you know common problems with CSV data. Um, then use a variety of original Python functions to translate and normalize the original data. This was sort of the bulk of the project was coding for various situations um, that would occur within ActMaster. Um, I chose to do it this way rather than use a tool like OpenRefine or something like that because the sort of freedom to do arbitrary translation um, I think made things work faster. I wasn't having to learn how to use a different tool um, I could just, and I could, you know, try and fail and try again and, and just sort of do things progressively. Um, then use Python's JSON library to assemble new accession records and then use the archives snake uh, extension for the API um, to load those records into archive space. So that's the, that's the broad outline of how the project worked. Um, for just some notes on working with the source data, um, I tried as a maxim to make as few edits directly to the source data as possible. Um, in my mind, this sort of minimizes the assumptions that you you make as the person doing the migration, as opposed to like accurately reflecting whatever assumptions happened in the source. I tried to be very respectful of the source for reasons that I can get into a little bit later. Um, and then also maximize continuity. Right, just like try to make sure that that what was in the original data ends up in the migrated data. Um, data largely normalized by tumble down logic. I don't know if there's like a better industry word for this, but like when I was trying to normalize a field, I would just start with the most common situation and try to mac match against like a regular expression or something like that. Um, and then, you know, if it matches, great. If it doesn't, you tumble down to the second most uh, common situation. And you can just do this repetitively, right? If you, if you fail every time you get to the bottom of the tumble, you have, you have an uncaught situation there. You can go back and code for whatever wasn't caught and then just keep going. So a lot of this, you know, is designed around just kind of building the thing progressively and then debugging by failure, right? Like have a lot of print statements run until you get something unexpected and then quit and just kind of move progressively through the program. Um, that to me is like, cause I don't have a like great technical understanding of, of Python made it sort of easy to just sort of uh, build things until they work and then move on. Um, just a little bit on the mapping and the translation of this document. Um, there are a few kind of quirks. You can see in the sort of third column from the left there that the date of accession is encoded as just month and day, um, which is fine if you're a human because you can just look at the first column there and see that the year was 1988. Um, but it's not great if you're the computer because um, the computer doesn't read the whole thing as a whole, it's just reading one part of it. So uh, 
I say this only to demonstrate that sometimes you have to do things that are slightly more complex than just take data from one field and put it in one other, you know, corresponding place in archive space. Um, this is particularly true in the red circle. There uh, is the how ACMaster encodes uh, extents, um, which is this uh, really helpful 0.5 R um, thing. Uh, what that means is one half of a record storage carton, um, but, you know, that's pretty unclear. And also there were like 17 different letters that were in use to denote different, uh, you know, form of media or type of box or whatever, anything to indicate size. Um, so I ended up having to construct a pretty big and annoying lookup table to do this. This was by far the hardest part, I think, that and, and getting all of the dates correct. Um, but this just to say that like the, it, there's a sort of varying complexity to actually unpacking data from something like this and making it useful in a destination system. Um, this is just to kind of show how the mapping eventually worked. It's not really important to this presentation that you understand how to, just to see that like most of the data from ACMaster is being used and a lot of it is being kind of recombined um, in, in several parts into construct one usable field for what happens in archive space. And that I think is, is what really sort of makes Python shine as a way to do this. Um, so I promise not to show a bunch of code. I just thought it would be helpful to like have an example of the tumble down logic that I was talking about. Um, this, is, this is a function designed to normalize uh, material dates. Um, so you can see in like each one of these sections, we're matching against a regular expression. Um, and I have this sort of marked up on the next slide here. Um, so so each each rung on the ladder we drop down, we're looking for a, you know, uh, a, a less common situation. So first we start and catch normal spans and then, you know, process those however we need to get them into archive space. And then we catch a single date, right? And process that however we need. And then we, and, and you just sort of go down the line. And then when you, if you, so if you run the entire column through the program and nothing falls out at the end, you know, you've caught every situation and, and you'll, you'll be able to process all of that data uh, at the, at, at runtime. So, um, the, the next step is to then encode everything as JSON, which is of course, well, I don't know about of course, but it's pretty simple. There's like a little bit of logic going on here where we have to make sure that we're getting the extents and the dates right and stuff like that. But mostly it's really just sticking the stuff that with the, the variables we've already processed into a JSON form, um, simple stuff. and. This is like my favorite part because uh, Archive Snake just sort of does all the work. At the beginning of this process, I thought that this would be the hardest thing. I didn't have a lot of experience working with APIs or scripting against them. Um, and by the end of the project, it was like, this was the easiest part. You know, it took like 10 minutes to implement this um, because Archive Snake just makes everything so easy. Uh, if you're not, if you're working with the API at all and you're not, yeah, I, I would highly recommend um taking a look at this because anyway like you can see this is the entire part of the script that interacts with the api so that's nice and simple here's an example of the result this is this the same data from the line i was breaking down before um it's pretty sparse for an archive space accession record but it's uh the, the data in here is good you know you've like a, a full title you got some sort of content description where the thing what record group the thing ended up in uh a provenance statement uh and then of course structured dates and extents the way that archive space likes them um so it, it's 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 pretty pretty well structured data um, two things that I wanted to point out about this that I'll talk about in my sort of takeaways are one in the in the title I chose to append to the title of all of these things, this little tag that says Agmaster on them, which in my mind makes it clear to everyone what they're looking at when they look at this record. Um, I, I tried to make this as easy of a process for staff when they start using this data as possible. So just indicating that they're looking at a record that was generated programmatically, um, I think is useful. And I put it in the title so that it would show up in the search results in the search index when you, things come up, 
you'll know that you're looking at a bunch of things and some of them came in programmatically from this uh, document that we previously used. The other thing is that down in the general note, um, at the end of the process, and this is one of the reasons I tried to stay away from making any changes to the source data was that I could then at the end take all of the fields as they originally came in, kind of stick them together as pairs around a pipe character, um, and then drop that in the general note so that the user has ready access to whatever the original data was in archive space unless anything screwy happened with the mapping or in case something is uh, confusing. Um, so as a result of the project, we now have 9,000 new accession records in archive space. It, that's about 20 times what we had before because we had only been entering new ones um into archive space so that's obviously like a large uh increase in the coverage of our collection um it reduced at least by one the number of resources that we had to use for description because this uh, has completely replaced ACMaster as a way to get at this data and a way to update it um the migrated accessions can now be linked to resources so like this this has changed at least a little bit the like way that we have processing workflows um it's much easier now to like detect when there might be some bits and pieces that we would want to bring all together under one new identifier it improves the clarity of provenance between those things um, and it also just eliminates some duplicate labor where before we might have gone back and retroactive retroactively created or an accession record in archive space to store some sort of data. It's almost never going to be the case that we have to do that now. Um, it's increased the visibility for what I would call legacy collections or collections that are from before archive space, at least internally. We don't have the um, external discovery function of archive space enabled, but you know, it, for us internally, you can now do sort of fuzzy archive space keyword searching against this like database of titles you weren't, which you weren't able to do before. Um, so it's, uh, I don't know, for me at least, it's much easier to search than using control F in the access document. Um, the majority of resources that are held by U UW archives should now be visible in archive space. I am, that's sort of a probable statement, again, because I, I don't know precisely uh, what the Venn diagram between things that are in the electronic catalog and things that were in this database were, um, but it, it does mean that we have way more access via archive space itself to collections going much farther back uh, than we had before, at least at the title level. So um, that's just a really, really useful thing for us to have. So last bit here is just some quick lessons I thought that might be sort of general. Tony, generally applicable. yes. T let me just, you have two more minutes. I just wanted to give you okay. a warning. Uh, I will. Uh, zoom through this. So first thing is just to make sure that you have uh, a proof of concept. Um, it helps to, you know, get support from your supervisor and stuff like that. If you can demonstrate that every chain in or link in the chain will work um, and then try to like anticipate the ways that the project will impact workplace functions. Um, so having a sort of proof of concept lets you, you know, have an example of maybe what resulting data will look like, and then you can more accurately predict what problems it might have and how it will affect what people are, are doing. Um, this is my this is my other sort of uh, philosophical thing. Just try not to mutate the source data. Um, migrating things can decontextualize them. Um, you can sometimes see things in the original data where you look at stuff that's next to other stuff, or where you know maybe fields have been transposed vertically or horizontally, um, and they'll make sense to you looking at them. But then when you migrate them, they're taken out of that context, and so you might not be able to solve the same problems. So having respect for the the source data, I think, can solve some of those problems, um, and and solve complexity as opposed to add it. Um, and then lastly, just always make it clear to the user what you're looking at. I tried to indicate how I was doing that on a previous slide, um, but I, I wanted the migrated data to be easy to distinguish. I wanted to give the viewer easy access to the original data. And then also I took out time to explain to everybody, you know, how this process worked, what problems the migrated data might have um, and how it might affect uh, what they're doing because it does have a certain impact on reference and, and processing work when you do something like this. 
So that's it. Um, I don't know if there will be any time for questions, but no questions before I say thank you for listening. <laughs> and here's my uh, email address. I always want to hear about people's projects like this. Even if I can't you know, help you with your problems, I can at least hear about them. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tony. Uh, you said in the beginning you didn't know uh, the audience here, but I got to say, you nailed it. Uh, that was really interesting. Um, I'm sure there already are questions in the Q&A, and I'm sure that there are more. Uh, it's always really interesting to see how archivists are tackling problems, and I think we it, the idea of like trying and failing really resonates with all of us, because that's a big part of our work now. So thank you so much for that presentation. We are right at time, though. So instead of doing Q&A, what I'm going to ask, Tony, if you can, if you could type your answers to the questions that are coming in the Q&A, and we answer them that way. So if you're um, listening along, I really encourage you to look in the Q&A for those answers. Uh, but yeah, thank you again, Tony. That was great. We're going to go Thanks, ahead and yeah. move on. Yeah, we're going to go ahead and move on to our next presentation. Um, so if you want to stop sharing your screen and uh, once you're stopped, um, Corey, if you want to go ahead and share yours and Corey, I can start reading your introduction. Sure thing. Let me All get right. uh, let me get it pulled up. All right. All right, Corey, you should be able to go ahead and share yours. All right. So our next presentation is from Corey Schmidt of the University of Georgia, who will be presenting Pathfinding Toward ArcLight, the journey to discover our next our next website framework. In 2023, the UGA libraries reaffirmed the decision to implement ArcLight as the next framework for their publicly available finding aid website. In this presentation, Corey will dive into the factors that help make this decision, including their analysis between using the archive space public user interface versus ArcLight and the next steps of this project. So Corey, over to you. Thank you so much, Jessica. Yeah, and thank you everybody for uh, coming to the virtual forum and for uh, giving me a platform to talk about our our journey. So yeah, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, and we'll go ahead and do that. So the outline for the presentation is I first want to give a brief history of our archival management practices here at the UJ libraries, uh, specifically looking at the Hargret and Russell libraries, since that uh, those two are the main libraries that we'll be um, focusing on for the for the website. Then I'm going to actually give a, a timeline of the project because it is a rather long project and it's it's taken over a couple years now. So giving some context about um, how we arrived at our decision, um, and then uh, getting into some of the decision making factors as to why we chose ArcLight um, over the ArcGIS PUI, for instance. Um, looking at things like the customizability, uh, maintainability, and the user experiences of both uh, frameworks, and then lastly. What does it take to implement ArcLight? And giving uh, hopefully some of you, if you are interested in implementing implementing it yourself, uh, some ideas about what it might take. So back in 2019, the Hargrit and Russell libraries were using two separate instances of Archivist Toolkit as their archival management uh, system. And they decided that they wanted to migrate to archive space. And as a result of that, they hired me as a project manager to manage the migration of those two instances. And I'm happy to report that it, at the end of 2020, we successfully migrated into archive space. But and in addition to that project, we also wanted to uh, unify two, two separate finding aid websites that both the Harger and Russell were, uh, libraries were standing up currently uh, at that time into one. So they wanted to merge Hargret's finding aid website and Russell's finding aid website into one. Um, both of them were using uh, what's called Extensible Text Framework or XTF as uh, sort of their framework for their website. That was originally built out at the California Digital Library. And when we had created uh, these two independent websites, um, we pulled from California Digital Library's uh, core code um, back in 2012, 2013. And we had been customizing uh, both uh, pretty much until we unified them uh, in uh, 2020, 2021. Um, and by the beginning of 2021, we had successfully unified um, both Hargrit and Russell finding aid websites into one um, using XTF. But during that process, uh, we kind of realized, wow, this is really old code. And uh, it was, while it was very familiar with a lot of our users and we had made some uh, 
really interesting customizations to to you know make the process a little easier, more intuitive for users and our own faculty and staff. We realized that it was just it, it was hanging on by a thread, and it, it, we're still using it. <laughs> so it's it's hanging on by a thread, and we even had uh, library library IT uh, come knocking on our door and say, "Hey, you've, you're you're facing deprecation warnings here. Uh, you might want to consider." moving off onto something else. So those those concerns really pushed us into um, researching what might be the next step for our finding website. So beginning in around January of 2021, we started investigating what different frameworks existed uh, out in the archives world. Um, we sent a survey to archive space users asking them what kind of uh, finding aid frameworks they were using. And uh, the results of that survey were that, you know, 60% of people were using the archive space PUI, which makes perfect sense. Uh, there were a few institutions back then who were on ArcLight already. Um, and there were a lot of other institutions who were either using some sort of homegrown uh, local system, uh, a local website, uh, or they were sending their finding aids to aggregators. Um, so we got that information. Uh, we also had our own, uh, our own people at Hargrid and Russell Libraries look at the different implementations of the archive space PUI and ArcLight um, that various institutions had set up during that time. And they reported back on what things they liked and what things they didn't like. Um, and we also did a little bit, just a little bit of user testing. Uh, and all that to say, you know, we compiled all this information and we chose ArcLight to replace XDF. Um, and then in June of 2021, uh, we started development work with uh, two in-house developers, one system administrator, and a project manager. Um, and at that time, we were starting with ArcLight version 0 0.5. Um, so we started developing. We started making a bunch of customizations, building, uh, building in our features and all that stuff. But uh, unfortunately, uh, January of 2022, our main developer left UGA. So the project at that point stalled, and we uh, we we kind of hit this uh, break point where we're just like, okay, well, we've got something. We, we've built some code, but it's not quite ready to be released yet. So let's put the brakes on uh, for a moment. But while we were putting on the brakes, actually the ArcLight community was stepping on the gas and they uh, started to host uh, bi-monthly community calls uh, hosted by Stanford University. And the end result of that was actually them releasing ArcLight version 1.0 by April of 2023. Um, so in between that time where we stopped development um, and up until now, uh, where we're actually starting development again, uh, ArcLight had gained a lot more, uh, a lot more steam as far as community involvement and updating the core code. Um, in March of 2023, we were lucky enough to hire uh, a developer, and um, in in 2023, you know, we were looking at uh, how the ArcLight community was was moving, and we were. And we reevaluated re our decision whether or not to stick with ArcLight or move to something like the Archive Space PUI, um, especially since you know two years had gone by and both had been updated. Um, but uh, by November of 2023, after talking with um, a bunch of different groups, stakeholders, dev team, and our own library administration, we agreed that we wanted to move forward with ArcLight. And I'm happy to report that in February of this year, we have started work uh, implementing ArcLight <laughs> Um, and setting up our own uh, uh, instance of that uh, using ArcLight 1.0, and we're we're doing it with uh, two in-house developers, a system administrator, and a project manager. If that sounds familiar, uh, and we hope to have something released by December of 2024. So with that context out of the way, why did we choose ArcLight, and specifically, why did we choose ArcLight? over something like the archive space PUI. So hopefully these next few slides will give you a little glimpse into our decision-making process. One of the big factors that we looked at between uh, the two uh, between the two frameworks was the customizability of each. Uh, we 
identified that for ArcLight, we would be able to build features the way we wanted them to be built. Um, and that was critical, especially when we were talking about something like integrating Aeon requesting. Um, we use Aeon for our collection management here uh, and for you know requesting, researchers request it and that kind of stuff. Um, so that is a critical function. We would not be able to uh, do our jobs without that. And we wouldn't be able to do our jobs without a finding aid website uh, that wouldn't have that functionality. Um, and the way ArcLight is set up, you know, ArcLight by default does not have any Aeon integration. So that's not great. But we noticed that different institutions, um, such as Duke University and uh, eventually University of Michigan, they were able to make Aeon work and work in really interesting and, and sometimes really close ways to how we wanted it to work. Um, so what we identified specifically looking at that functional, that, that feature set that we wanted to build out, that ArcLight would be really great for building something the way we wanted it to, which is um, being able to request um, a bunch of different boxes from a collection um, all at once um, and to minimize the time it takes to do that versus something like the ArcSB's PUI, where uh, you have a great plugin, the Aeon Request plugin. Um, and I think, you know, we identified it works really well, but it doesn't work exactly in the way we wanted it to. And when we compared different institutions that use the Aeon Request plugin to something like what we could build ourselves, uh, we identified that we'd really prefer it to do build something ourselves because it would save us so much time um, in the way we would structure uh, how the website was uh, how the website was laid out um, you know and, and that gets into the second bullet point of you know how we uh, how we wanted to change collection layouts um, so that you know users could easily see what's in an inventory and be able to click request box 185 request box uh, 199 that kind of thing um, so you know we realized that, there are a lot of great out of the box solutions for the archive space PUI um, and recent updates with uh, digital objects, you know, make um, looking at uh, finding those a lot easier for the archive space PUI, especially with the inclusion of uh, thumbnails being present. Um, but we, again, we kind of defaulted back to that mindset of, wow, we really want to do it this way. <laughs> like we want to do it in a different way and, that uh, that would uh, diverge from how archive space uh, the archive space PUI does it. Um, so ultimately, at the end of the day, when we were weighing both of them, we really wanted to um, we really had some some specific expectations of how we wanted things to work, and we thought that ArcLight would be a better candidate for making those changes as opposed to working with the archive space. Archive Space PUI, which would be more out of the box, and we would have to sort of retrofit our own processes and, and change our own processes in order to match those uh, expectations. The second point that we looked at was the maintainability of both systems. Uh, so ArcLight, we're actually really, uh, really lucky to have in-house expertise with Blacklight and Ruby on Rails. So for anybody who uh, isn't familiar, um, ArcLight is a is built using Blacklight. It is a Blacklight gem, and and Blacklight is is great because it's very well supported, especially in cultural cultural heritage sector. So there's a lot of great information. It's being regularly updated, um, and we've got developers who know how to work with it, um, who have built lots of Blacklight apps, um, and they've also worked with Ruby on Rails web app web applications. So for us, this was actually a really big win for being able to identify, OK, which one would we be able to sustain? Um, we did look into hiring an external vendor for development. Uh, we, we talked with Indiana University, who went down that route. Um, uh, ultimately, we didn't do that for two different reasons. Uh, one is because we were hesitant to uh, hire an external developer to make code and then have us maintain that code ourselves. Um, it's much more difficult to maintain someone else's code uh, than it is your own. So that was one hesitation we had. Another hesitation um, was that we ran out of money. 
we we had a pot of money and uh we needed we needed to use it for something else so sorry if the, if any of the developers are on this chat uh that's that's kind of what happened but um another point that we that we liked about arclight um but it's also a bit of a con as well is that it is an entirely separate system from archive space so what that means is we can continue to uh, update archive space completely independently from our finding aid website and vice versa. We can update ArcLight without having to change anything with archive space. Um, and so that actually works well because we can you know, sort of maintain both systems and, and keep them both up to date with having, without having too much conflict uh, between that. But you have to maintain two different systems now. So that is a little more unfortunate. And uh, lastly, we are less certain of ArcLight's future. Um, we know that it's being supported by big universities, Stanford, University of Michigan, Duke, Indiana, um, and a host of others. Um, but it doesn't have the same uh, organizational or community support that ArchivesSpace has, right? ArchivesSpace is hosted uh, or is uh, is part of the organizational home of Lyricis. Um, Archive Space is receiving regular updates supported by a very robust community. Um, on the other hand, if we were to try and, and customize the Archive Space PUI to make it fit with our own expectations, that would mean it would make it more difficult to sustain our local changes and our local customizations because uh, we found that other institutions that did heavily customize their PUI some of them got stuck on very old versions of archive space for very long periods of time. And we wanted to avoid that um, if it was possible. So uh, we kind of looked at both scenarios and we leaned more toward ArcLight mainly because we do have the in-house expertise and because it's a separate system. So we're able to sustain um, sustain it without affecting uh, our other our archive space instance. Lastly, talking very briefly about the user experience, um, we did a little bit of user testing in 2021 where we took researchers and they they looked at uh, ArcLight without any customizations and the Archive Space PUI without any customizations. Um, and generally they found it easier or, or feeling a bit more comfortable to work in ArcLight. They liked the uh, the feel of ArcLight a little more. It felt a little bit more modern than the Archive Space PUI. Um, there were also some features about ArcLight that they really liked. Um, there were more filters in search results, and the search results themselves were a bit easier to understand. Um, however, there were things that the Archive Space PUI did really well. Um, the initial shirt, the initial search for the Archive Space PUI. Um, had a lot more options and was a bit easier to understand. Um, uh, there was a uh, content content layout um, was a little easier. Um, I believe on the right hand side, there's like a table of contents um, in the archive space PUI that users actually found uh, pretty intuitive to use to, to find uh, nested items within collections. Um, but you know, looking looking at both, uh, there were pros and cons to each. Uh, some features were better in, in one framework than the other. Um, if you want a really deep dive into those pros and cons, I would highly recommend checking out Duke's own evaluation of both platforms. Uh, it is a bit dated, right? That was done around 2020, 2021, I believe, when they were starting to, uh, starting to implement their ArcLight instance. But it really does a great job of breaking down feature set by feature set what each platform does. So highly recommend you checking out checking that out. So user experience, again, we kind of found that users tended to slightly prefer ArcLight, but it really was close. You know, you could go either way, and there were features about both frameworks that were good. So I'll end very quickly with. If you're considering implementing ArcLight, you're looking at it thinking, you know, hey, should we give this a shot? Um, this is kind of what we're doing. So this might give you an idea of what it takes to implement ArcLight. Um, right now we have a dedicated development team and 
uh, project team. So we have two developers, in-house developers um, doing the coding. We have one system administrator who is uh, who has helped set up our uh, code uh, repository and help man and helps manage all of that uh, the deployment of uh, of the website. Um, one project manager who is myself, and I kind of act as the go between between uh, development team and system administrator and the primary stakeholders. Those primary stakeholders being uh, faculty and staff from the Margaret and Russell libraries who take a look at issues, they look at, you know, updates and they say, yes, I like that. No, I don't like that. Can we change that? And that sort of thing. Um, we expect it to take about a year for development. You know, our developers are working on other things on top of this, so it's not completely full time. Um, so your mileage may vary depending on how much time you're able to um, get from your development team, if you have a development team at all. So that is uh, something to consider. Um, another thing to consider is the time it takes to create feature requirements and document user needs. It took around four to six months to create our initial list of all the different features, changes that we wanted to make in, um, in Arclight. Um, we wrote those up as, uh, as Google Docs and we put them as issues in GitLab for our code management and documentation. Um, and then we reevaluated all of those issues again in 2023, 2024. So that was great fun uh, <laughs> to, to rehash all that documentation. Um, but ultimately too, uh, I just wanna mention help from the community, the Arclight community has been extraordinarily uh, essential. We've talked with implementers, developers from many different institutions. Um, we've been regularly involved with the community calls that they continue to host. So if you are interested or looking into, uh, looking into Arclight as your next, uh, as your next framework, highly recommend getting involved with the community. They have a Code for Lib Slack channel that is uh, very active. They have a Google group and those community calls, which of course anybody is welcome to attend. Um, and ultimately at the end of the day, we hope to push some of our own code to core, uh, to Arclight core code, um, where, where we think it'd be beneficial for the whole community. And that is my presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I hope I came in at time uh, and maybe got uh, maybe have a little bit of time for questions but if you'd like to email me for more information there's a lot I left out um, <laughs> you can email me at corey.schmidt at uga.edu and thank you so much for your time really appreciate it thank you Corey yeah if you left a lot out that just means that there's a part two at the next forum right we'll hear once you launch at the end of the year we'll need to hear more um, to that end we do have one question in the Q&A already we have Three minutes for Q&A. So if you have some questions, please feel free to pop them in. Emily asks, uh, do you plan to do any additional user testing before launch? We hope so. <laughs> um, we have uh, we have not. I need to I need to reevaluate our timeline to see if we can fit that in. We unfortunately kind of sort of lost our user experience librarian. Um, and by lost, I mean he got promoted, so that was great. Uh, but that also means that we're, we're a bit hamstrung for like local expertise in doing user testing. But I really hope that we can maybe scrap something together so that we have some data to report on to make that uh, before we go live. Gotcha, thanks. Uh, Sarah says, you may have mentioned this and I missed it, but how many developers are working on your Arclight implementation right now? There are two. Uh, one of them is more or less like a full-time developer. Um, and the other one is half developer, half manager. Um, so we, uh, that's, that's how many people we're working with. Um, and yeah, they're, they're using, they're on other projects. So getting their time um, can be a bit tricky, which is why, you know, we, we've given ourselves a year, um, but yeah. Thanks. All right. Uh, no other questions are popping up in the Q&A, but of course, if you have one, um, feel free to drop it in and, and maybe Corey can text and answer or type and answer <laughs> uh, via text. Um, but we're going to go ahead and take our break. We're going to break for 10 minutes. But Corey, thank you so much. Uh, it was really interesting to hear your thoughtful review process and how you came to that decision. It was really interesting. Um, and very helpful and definitely probably will require a follow-up. 
Definitely, probably. All right, we're going to go ahead and take a break now. Uh, we're going to do a 10-minute break, or technically, I think, an 11-minute break. 10 minutes. Uh, we're going to return at five minutes after the hour, so please feel free to step away for the next 10 minutes, but we will be returning in, in, in 10 minutes. Thanks.
Welcome back, everyone. We are going to get started with our last hour of today's content. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen. And John, if you want to go ahead and start sharing yours while I read your introduction. All right. So uh, next up, we have John DeWeese of University of Rochester presenting Connecting Metadata and Digital Assets, Archive Space and Preservica. Bringing together a metadata management system like ArchivesSpace and a digital asset management system like Preservica so that they can communicate with each other can be a complicated process. This presentation will discuss how the University of Rochester developed their workflow to create digital objects within ArchivesSpace efficiently at scale, as well as provide access to the digital surrogates or born digital assets that researchers want to access. Take it away, John. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is John DeWeese, and I'm the Senior DAM Specialist at the University of Rochester. Uh, and today we're here to talk about workflows for connecting archive space with the digital uh, asset management system, Preservica. Um, also, through all of my timings of this presentation, we should have like oodles of time at the end for questions. So please feel free to kind of get those ready. Uh, so the goal here is to rectify two different systems that act as sources of truth for different things. Uh, in this case, archive space for metadata and Preservica for digital assets. Uh, to keep them both useful, uh, archive space needs to be able to persistently and accurately link out to where digital objects are stored, and Preservica needs to be able to persistently and accurately describe the resources that it stores. Uh, the answer is to programmatically link these two platforms so that they can stay in sync over time and communicate with each other by directly directionally. Uh, luckily, Preservica has built an extension to their software uh, using the Archive Space API that allows this functionality. Uh, it in, imports Archive Space EAD as metadata into Preservica, uh, creates a digital object in Archive Space, and then keeps both of these up to date over time. Uh, the issue is that creating the submission information packages or SIPs in such a way that Preservica can both properly ingest them and successfully link them up to archive space is like pretty challenging to do manually. Uh, I struggled in formulating this talk because it is very easy to go down a series of rabbit holes related to the hierarchical archive space data model, the AD's metadata schema, Preservica's PACS data model, and its associated OPEX metadata schema. It all ends up being way more than can feasibly get crammed into a conference session. Uh, so the focus here is an overview of what those SIPs need to look like, how they relate to both systems in play, uh, and the solution I've come up with to try and make this process easier. Uh, for those comfortable doing some coding, I've got both a, a Python script library, and for those who aren't, uh, I've created a little graphical utility for the Windows users out there that enables the creation of these SIPs with a handful of button clicks. Uh, finally, a word, a word about dependencies. Uh, this currently requires the digitization work order plugin uh, created by NYU to be installed and used in archive space. Uh, we were able to have Lyricist install this for us without issue, but I do realize this might complicate things for folks. Uh, so that everyone has an idea of what uh, the desired end state of all of this is, I've got a couple of screenshots here showing a successfully synced collection. Uh, on the right hand side, we have a snippet of the finding aid structure in the archive space PY showing a collection series and subseries uh, along with individual items. Uh, on the left, we have a view inside Preservica, whereby you can see that the finding aid hierarchy and structure have been replicated as a series of nested folders. Uh, there are differences, such as Preservica only brings over the title itself and not the constructed title that includes the date, for instance. Uh, also, it sorts everything in alphabetical order rather than in what order you have decided in your archive space finding aid. Uh, also, talking about data models, uh, everything that is an archival object in archive space becomes a folder in Preservica. Uh, however, both Preservica folders and assets can become digital objects in archive space. Uh, this ends up being kind of weird with collections described at the item level because those items end up being folders with precisely one asset in them, uh, the folder representing the archival object, the asset corresponding to the digital object. Okay, so that's the desired endpoint, but let's jump back to the beginning. Uh, on the left, we have circled in red where you can actually find the option to generate a digitization work order once that NYU plugin has been installed. Uh, this shows up in the more menu when you navigate to a collection record, uh, though it's always a little bit cut off in the browser for me. Uh, on the right, we have the interface for the plugin. Uh, here you can very granularly select precisely which elements you'd like included in the work order. Uh, if you uncheck a series or subseries, everything included in that portion of the hierarchy is then also excluded. Uh, you have the option to generate a report, which just outputs a bunch of data from archive space, 
or generate a work order, which takes the extra step of assigning a value to the component identifier field in archive space. Uh, and this exports as a TSV file, a tab separated values file, but that's pretty easy to import into Excel and turn into a standard Excel workbook or a CSV file or anything else you might want. Uh, we've got a couple of screenshots of snippets from the output of the digitization work order plugin that we were uh, looking at in the previous screen. Uh, it can export a whole host of data, but I've only included on the screen what, we've, what we'll need for our purposes. Uh, this includes the ref ID identifier that Archive Space assigns to all resources, uh, the URI, which I'll generally refer to as the archival object number, as that is what we care about from that column, uh, the resource title, uh, the component ID or CUID, and more on that in just a second, uh, and any associated dates. Uh, the CUID isn't mandatory in this process, but one of the things that we've been working on at UR is overhauling our file naming practices to try to make them as consistent and really importantly, as durable as possible. Uh, to that end, the work order plugin can automatically assign these CUIDs to records, which we then use in the resulting file names to create the strong connection between the files and the metadata to make sure they can be contextualized over time. Uh, so we, here we are just looking at a, a simple screen grab from inside Windows Explorer. Uh, for the purpose of this talk, we're not focusing on the workflow if you're writing a bunch of Python scripts, but instead on if you were using the graphical utility that hopefully might make folks' lives easier. Uh, this is our before state, where we have a folder that has our digitization work order uh, with all the great data we discussed in the previous slide, as well as all the associated archival master images as single page TIFFs and the access copies of the assets as multi-page PDFs. And these just all get dumped into one folder together. Uh, I would like to insert my usual disclaimer at this point. Uh, I am but a librarian who eventually ran into a spreadsheet project that I just couldn't do manually, so I finally broke down and learned Python. But when I'm not is a software developer. Please bear that in mind. Uh, furthermore, I realize this utility is not going to be winning any beauty prizes. Uh, but the next few slides, we'll go over briefly the functionality of the graphical utility, descriptively called the PAX OPEX utility, or what I'm now simply calling Chimera. Uh, one version of the mythological creature is described as having aspects of a snake, a lion, and a goat, so it felt appropriate. Uh, the snake representing the Python code that enables the utility, uh, but I'll leave it as an exercise for the listener to determine whether Preservica or Archive Space ends up being the regal lion or the ornery goat in the scenario, probably based on whichever system is giving you more issues at the moment. Uh, anyways, Chimera has an interactive panel on the left and an output screen on the right. Uh, this pre-ingest tab is where you set up your SIP generation action. Uh, you can specify where the folder that we saw in the previous slide is located and specify where the work order spreadsheet is located and how many rows have data that we care about. Uh, there are some basic customization options as well where you can specify uh, which file extension represents your preservation or access assets, you know, so uh, PDF for access, TIFF for preservation. Uh, you can opt to have Chimera take the ISO 8601 formatted dates from the work order spreadsheet and convert them into conventionally formatted dates in like a, a month, day, year convention, and then concatenate those with the title. Uh, and you can specify what the character is that separates your consistent file name prefix from the sequence number typically at the end of a file name that lets you distinguish page numbers. Uh, final note, you can opt to generate a file manifest for quality control purposes. Uh, this just ends up being a CSV file with one column full of file names and a second column full of corresponding um, checksums, either MD5 or SHA-1. Uh, you can then use this to make sure nothing gets corrupted in transit to Preservica afterwards by comparing the files and file names and checksums that you have locally in this CSV file with what uh, Preservica is then feeding you back after ingest. Uh, once you transfer your SIPs into Preservica, the linking process doesn't happen automatically. Uh, there are some additional tasks to shift the content into an appropriate folder, and then a workflow is executed to create the initial link with archive space. Uh, Chimera has some quality of life functions to help try and make this process a little easier in the post ingest tab. Uh, so long as your Preservica account is an administrator, you can use your credentials to move assets from one folder to another. Uh, this is also where you can locate the relevant file manifest to do that aforementioned quality control. Uh, long term, I really like the idea of turning Chimera into sort of a workbench where you can do all sorts of useful things that either Archive Space or Preservica doesn't do out of the box. Uh, in the last utilities tab, there is one example of what this could look like. Here you can enter the identifier for a given folder in Preservica and it will output how many assets and files are contained in the folder, uh, as well as how much storage that folder takes up. 
Uh, this information will be useful in populating out an extent field in archive space, for instance, to provide context of the nature of your digital assets back into the finding aid. Okay. So rather than trying to do a live demo, uh, I've recorded a quick video of Chimera in action. Uh, the output panel on the right shows what it is doing at every step of the way because there are quite a few steps under the hood involved in creating the SIPs. Uh, the idea here is that if this blows up for you, uh, copy the contents of the output panel into a text file and send it to me and hopefully I'll be able to figure out what went wrong and how to fix Chimera up as a result. Uh, some other things to note is that a lot of these options in Chimera can be saved in a little JSON file that sits, sits in a, um, wherever you store the program on your computer. Uh, underneath the output panel, hitting the save button will record all these options into the JSON file and then display will out output all the values in the screen above. Uh, as a result though, if you opt to save your password and two-factor token, that becomes sort of a security issue because the JSON file is just plain text, uh, but there's nothing saying you have to, it's just for convenience sake. Um, the help button will display documentation on whatever tab you are currently on. Uh, the clear button will wipe the output panel clean and the about button shows software version number, last updated date and my contact information. Uh, exit is pretty self-explanatory. Okay, so here we finally have the after state, a job that has successfully been run through Chimera. Uh, at the top, we have a folder labeled container with the date and time the job was run to help provide a little extra context. Uh, that should be able to be just dragged and dropped in such a way that Preservica's OPEX incremental ingest will do all the work of the actual ingest. Uh, the file right below the container file, but named identically, uh, is actually that file manifest CSV that's used for quality control. Uh, so that won't go over to Preservica. Uh, finally, we've got the original digitization work order sitting right where it has been the entire time. Uh, so when you run all of this, it takes those folders or it takes all of those assets we saw in the before state and then creates this folder structure and on a, um, navigates everything to where it needs to be. Um, inside the container folder, we have individual folders representing discrete archival objects, uh, plus a metadata file for the container folder. Uh, inside each of these archival objects, we have a zipped digital object package containing all the asset files, those PDFs and TIFFs, uh, plus a metadata file describing it. Uh, and then in each folder of the hierarchy, we also have a metadata file that describing the folder itself. Um, just kind of in general, metadata for folders lives inside of the folder it is describing. Uh, metadata for uh, assets or digital objects sits next to that digital object and everything is kind of named similarly to match them up. Okay, so starting to look at the actual metadata. Uh, this is all of the OPEX metadata that is a, a schema particular to Preservica. Um, let's look at those metadata for one of those zip digital objects. Uh, we're not gonna look at everything here, but the things circled in red call out data that was pulled from our digitization work order. Uh, we've got the title that was then combined with the converted ISO 8601 date that, was, uh, that were both present in the spreadsheet to create the title for Preservica. Uh, the archive space ref ID is also present here as the syncing process requires a unique identifier and the identifier from archive space seems like a great way to satisfy this need. Uh, and you can also see a checksum was generated for the whole zip file, uh, which Preservica compares against during its ingest process, adding another layer of quality control. Uh, here we have the metadata for the archival object folder containing the digital asset and its metadata. There's not a ton to see here other than noting that it is using the archival object number from the URI column of the work order spreadsheet. Uh, both of these also have little descriptive metadata snippets that are needed for syncing with Preservica, uh, but aren't anything we really need to get into here. They never change, they're always consistent. They just need to be present in the metadata files. Uh, finally, let's see what this actually looks like in Preservica and in archive space at the end of this very long journey. Uh, so this is a view of an individual asset within Preservica where you can now see a lot of the elements and previous screenshots represented in the system itself, such as the constructed title at the top, uh, a slew of metadata uh, or a slew of identifiers in the center and a preview of the asset itself. Uh, we're in the middle of a big project, a migration project from Island Dora over to Preservica. Um, so we are bringing all sorts of metadata along for the ride, including Dublin Core and mods. We're generating uh, new uh, premise preservation metadata records. But uh, however, crucially here, you can see the imported EAD from archive space, which is what we care about. Uh, if anything about this metadata changes in archive space, a nightly job that uh, Preservica runs will check for changes and then pull them over automatically. Uh, this is again to stress that for descriptive metadata, Preservica is not the source of truth, but instead of archive spaces. Uh, this metadata doesn't look particularly clean. However, uh, metadata display is one next big area for us to tackle now that a key position has been filled at my institution in our metadata services department. 
Uh, this just shows the data model in Preservica, so you can see how those TIFF images have been declared uh, preservation representations, while the PDF is the access representation. Uh, this is downstream effects for where content is stored and how it can be accessed, but not super important for our purposes. And now let's switch over to archive space. So you can see the archival object here in the finding aid. Uh, nothing much to see out of the ordinary other than to note that the component unique identifier is present where it previously was not before we generated that work order um, using the NYU plugin. Um, and, it, uh, and yeah, that's it. Um, and then let's switch over to the digital object, which is a little bit more interesting for our purposes. Uh, so this is the digital object that was connected to and attached to the previous archival object we just saw. Um, and this was automatically created by Preservica as part of the syncing process and it required no manual work whatsoever. Uh, the file version section then provides links out to the administrative backend of Preservica, as well as to the, Pres the Preservica public user interface if that is in use at your org. Uh, and that kind of wraps up. Uh, I hope this was at all useful to you all. Uh, I've got the GitHub links to both the raw script library as well as to where you can actually download Chimera. Um, some limitations to note briefly are that Chimera assumes that your finding aid is described to the item level. I realize that is a like massive assumption and that you know we're all dealing with huge backlogs and the idea of getting all of our finding aids to the item level is a massive lift. Um, but something I'm hoping to tackle over the next year is to build out some additional functionality so that Chimera can handle multiple characterizations of finding aids, such as ingesting at the series or the collection level to try and make this a little bit more verbose in its applications. So I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you here. Uh, and if you have any questions about any of this, truly don't hesitate to reach out. I'd love to chat with you uh, about this work. Um, and I think we've got plenty of time. So if folks have questions, I would love to answer them. And sorry, I have not been monitoring the chat or the Q&A. That's fine, John. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. Uh, yeah, but first off, we've gotten a thank you for the cat. So I'll go ahead and acknowledge that <laughs> before we move to the questions. Um, but uh, the first question is from Brian. For item tilting, did you consider using a computer readable date at the front end of the title? For item titling, sorry. Did you consider using a computer readable date at the front of the title for system sorting to be date ordered? Oh, that's interesting. Um... No, you see, this is where I kind of admit also that I like I'm not an archivist. I am like a digital librarian sort of person. So uh, our I, all of the practice that I saw in our finding aids was like title concatenated with like human readable date. So I just assumed that was best practice. Um, but that is an interesting idea. That could be a cool uh, enhancement. Uh, thank you very much for that idea. I'm gonna write that down. Um, are you, uh, uh, Brian also asked, are you also using the hierarchy modification part of the plugin that will rearrange the items folders if the archive space hierarchy changes? Yes, I believe so. It, yeah, that is my understanding. Yeah. Thanks. Um, all right. We do have plenty of time for, for questions. Uh, if you have any questions, Please do drop them into the q and I'm speaking slowly. <laughs> Just navigate back to the, the uh, links if anybody wants to jot those down or anything. Uh, also, I threw all of this up into um, our institutional repository at UR. So um, I know that this is going to be recorded and on the ASpace uh, website as well. So uh, all this stuff is uh, available. Um, shoot me an email and I can send you the link. All right, we do have another question from Crystal. Is this your process on a go forward basis as well as for your backlog? Uh, yeah, um, so yes. Um, it, well, actually, could you talk a little bit more about that? Like our process in terms of describing everything at the item level? Um, I think uh, Crystal, please chime in with clarification, but I'm gonna make one up. Uh, the idea that this, so this was you dealing with a backlog or as a large uh, project, is this going to be, are you gonna use the same workflow going forward for all of your materials? Oh, gotcha, yes, absolutely, yeah. Um, so this originally kind of spun out of a script library that I had built specifically to migrate from Islandora to Preservica. And then I um, ended up sort of just building it out as like kind of starting from, from scratch, like you, have like a, you know, a, a researcher come in and say, you know, I want big swaths of this collection digitized and made available to me. Um, so then you can 
use the NYU plugin for what it was originally, the original purpose of it, which was to create digitization work orders um, for your lab uh, so that they could then take that, digitize all of the stuff and then build out the finding aid um, as a result afterwards to kind of get some of that data to go back into the finding aid. Um, so th this is kind of, this is our general purpose uh, workflow going forward. Um, though again, we actually just finished the first couple ingests that we've done at the series level instead of the, um, instead of the item level. So now I'm trying to figure out how I need to get that to be reflected in the graphical utility as well. Thanks. Um, Kayla asks, have you been told or do you know if the new data model portal in Preservica will affect your process? I don't, God, I really <laughs> hope not. Boy, I really hope not. Um, Write that down, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we, uh, we're lucky that we have, well, we don't have a huge development team at my institution, but we do um, have some resources there. So we have a, we're using the WordPress-based uh, universal access front end the like the kind of the Preservica PY uh, rather than the new portal because um, we want to have that sort of customization options um, and we haven't run into any issues with that so far because I, I, I don't I, my understanding at least is that the data model should stay consistent enough that it is able to be reflected in the new portal as well without issue um, Though I'm sure now that I've said that, I'm probably utterly wrong about it. Uh, Preservica is hard to keep up to date with <laughs> from, from like a professional development perspective. Uh, thanks. Uh, another question in the q and I know you mentioned the workflow is dependent on the NYU plugin. Is there a world where this application can be used without the need for this plugin? I imagine the need to get this to work without the plugin might be difficult. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so one of the things that I'd like to, like really all we need is like a few sort of like values for every record or series or whatever to somehow be fed into this graphical utility. You know, things like title, things like dates, things like the the archive space ref ID, that sort of thing. Um, so, so long as they are being fed into in like some kind of spreadsheet form, um, like whether that's a TSV or a CSV or a workbook or whether the NYU plugin is generating it, or not, um, that, that's kind of all we really need. So that's one of the things that I'd like to enhance is just to say, like, you know, I'm, I'm uh, to, to be able to specify, like, here is, you know, the, the data input, here's where you can find the different things in the different columns, and then let the, um, the utility kind of just take it from there. Um, so that, that's one of the enhancements I'm hoping to do over the summer. Um, also speaking of enhancements, this whole thing, the whole graphical utility is built on uh, this Python library called PySimple GUI, um, which just rug pulled everybody by, it was pre previously freely accessible um, and now they're charging for access. So another summer project is going mm -hmm. to be uh, to rebuild it using a different graphical interface. Um, so that mostly just to say, if you download it in like the next couple of weeks and see that the styling of it changes over the summer, that will be the reason why. But of course, nothing <laughs> was ever consistent. Thanks. Uh, that the next question was from Brian asking uh, if you use PySimple GUI. So I guess that was why that was asked, and we, now we know the answer. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, another question: um, Could you describe again the item folder asset incongruity between the systems that you mentioned at the beginning of your talk? I'm not sure I understood. Item folder. At, oh, um, I'm gonna apologize. I'm gonna back up through the slides a bunch. To see if I, I think I know what you're talking about. Hmm. Okay, so is this kind of referring to um, kind of the folders and assets in Preservica versus archival objects and digital objects in archive space? Yes, that part. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, so an, an archival object will always become a folder in Preservica, but the inverse isn't always true. So you can have um, digital objects in archive space represent um, either folders. Um, so for instance, for something like a series level ingest um, or a digital object uh, straight up representing an, an asset in Preservica, like, a, like an atomic actual record in, in Preservica. Um, so, but how that actually plays out is just the difference between a series level and an item level ingest um, for how you're getting stuff into Preservica in my experience. Um, 
So, which is mostly just to say that this is a little bit more customizable um, uh, for, the, for the the general syncing process in general, kind of uh, uh, different from what the utility is, what, what Chimera is actually able to do, which is only at the item level currently, um, just because of the limitations of the code, which I hope answers your question. Thanks. If it doesn't, please follow up. Yeah. <laughs> Um, all right. There are no other questions in the Q and A right now. Um, we'll give it another minute. Megan says thanks, so I hope that answered. Um, oh, just responding to Corey in the chat. Yeah, that that's also my experience. I'm like being very careful not to update Python GUI to version five so that it doesn't break. Um, my, I think I'm gonna use one of the underlying um, frameworks to Kinter. Um, which I think is firmly open source and won't get pulled. Um, but anyways, that's uh, just a little bit about the Python stuff underneath. All right. Not seeing any other questions in the Q&A, though it sounds like there's plenty of discussion happening in the chat about this. Um, so we'll go ahead and uh, say thank you very much. Thank you uh, to John. This was great. Um, lots of, of good cat references and overall nerdy stuff. So I really appreciate it. <laughs> we enjoyed it. Uh, feel free to go ahead and stop sharing your screen. Um, and then uh, we have our last presentation of the day is Kate Herbert. Kate, if you'd like to go ahead and share your screen while I read your introduction and we can keep things moving. Um, Kate, you are the last session for the day. So feel free to take um, all the time that you need. I don't really have that many closing remarks. I will say that. Um, all right. Kate is sharing. All right, so our last presentation of the day is Kate Herbert from the Main State Archives, who's presenting A Matter of Scale. This presentation will give the Main State Archives perspective on working in archive space when your institution has very large collections, how this changes some uses of the platform and its effects on workflows and data entry. This is a case study of the roadblocks Main State Archives has come up against and how we have overcome them, and a conversation with others with very large resources to share issues and solutions. Take it away, Kate. Okay. Um, so my name is Kate Herbert. I'm the digital archivist at the Maine State Archives. Um, and at first, some background. Um, so the so to, to find some terms, um, as I said, we have a very large collection, um, but we sort of have a oddly structured collection as well. Um, so we only have 31 resource records but we have over 200,000 archival objects, almost 60,000 top containers, one accession record, and 37,000 plus digital objects. Um, and as I said, I am the digital archivist and for up until, well, it will be May now, um, I have been the only digital archive staff. Um, we are hiring a second person um, and I said they'll start in May. Um, and to give, Kate, yep. Can I um, just so you know, you do have a presenter view up on your screen. Oh. If you if that's intentional, that's fine. But uh, nope. I just want to make sure in case you had some notes on your other yes. slides you didn't want us to see. <laughs> Is that better? Perfect. That's good. Yeah. We're good now. For some perspective, um, the paper side of the collection is um, over. 44,000 linear feet. So a big collection. Um, so sort of a brief history of archive space for us. Um, we started using archive space in um, 2015, um, entering items really slowly. We were vetting everything, cleaning up the data. Um, so that by 2018, we only had about a little less than 10% of our containers entered. Um, that is also the year I started as digital archivist. So before that, we had no um, sort of dedicated digital staff. Um, so in 2020, uh, we had to move our entire paper collection because we had a um, catastrophic failure of the HVAC system in our building. 
Um, and so that sort of lit a fire and we ended up adding the rest of our collection very quickly to archive space so that we could track the move. Um, also as part of that in 2021, we launched the archive space PUI so that um, because of the move, we were now in um, a place where we could only serve by appointment only. And so this allowed our patrons to actually search our catalog and made things much more efficient. So we have been sort of living in our temporary space. Um, and then we had two major additions that are happening sort of within the next couple of months, which is we get our another position and um, we launch our digital preservation system. And that will obviously compound the issues that I'm talking about because with that will come a lot more records. And then um, now penciled in is January, 2025, we will move our collection back. So we have another very large move in front of us. So as I said, um, the majority of this, I'm gonna sort of go through some of the problems that we have come across because our collection is so large and some of those solutions um, and I hope we'll have enough time for a good discussion afterwards. So first problem being that both our archival objects and top containers exceed the 50,000 record limit for custom report templates. Um, as I said before, we have, you know, hundreds of thousands of archival objects and um, with top containers, I think we're over 60,000 now. So the solution we've done, and as many of the presenters have been talking about, um, we are using the API to run the reports um, because it allows us to get all of the data we need. Um, I sort of modified some existing um, scripts um, and sort of simplified them for our use as reports. So there's not much you have to change so that I can run the reports for all kinds of different um, endpoints, so top containers, digital objects, um, but also agents, container profiles, and such. So I do this use, using Jupyter Notebook. I'll run the report. It will create a JSON file. And then I use OpenRefine to make it look more like a ports report so other members of our team can use the report data depending on our needs. Um, this is very um, much how we managed our move and it, it enabled us to track our top containers. And at the moment, all of our containers have two locations, their original location, um, which is tied to our old records and management database, and then the current location in our temporary storage. So it allowed us to manage all of that at scale. Okay, another problem. Um, some of the finding aids that we generate through the normal process in archive space are over a thousand pages long, um, which obviously isn't too useful for most people. Um, it's useful for printing maybe sections or for us to have one copy in our reading room, but not so much if people want to be able to have their own copy or for us to be able to regularly print people a copy. So the solution for this one, again, um, we ran a modified XLT against uh, the AADX port. Um, this also made things a little bit quicker um, as the EAD export tends to be a little bit quicker than running the PDF. Um, and it also allowed us to simplify it a lot um, by removing most of the notes, um, limiting the dates to only the year or the year range and just modifying some co some columns so that it was much more simplified. Um, and we did also add the note on the um, cover page stating that this was just for basic reference and giving the link to the archive space install PUI so that um, people would know that there's a more searchable thing. But if we still have a lot of patrons who prefer paper so that they can have something to refer back to.
Um, so our next problem, similar to the last presenter, was the integration of our digital preservation system um, and with our archive space install. Um, we wanted to make sure that the archive space install would always be sort of the um, application of record for all of our metadata. Um, and we are not using Preservica, we're actually using LibNova. Um, so they are sort of um, in the box archive space um, install is assumes that you can make a whole map of your repository whenever you need to sync data. Um, and obviously for many reasons that won't work with us because um, I haven't had a chance to test it against our production archive space, but um, it would take hours if not days. So our solution and this one is not pretty, but it does work um, is to use the API or EAD export to get the ref IDs or the URIs um, to be able to um, manually um, add them to the ingestion spreadsheet. Um, I'm hoping this is a new solution. I'm hoping that over time we'll be able to refine this. Um, and then we had to have them disable the integration feature that automatically would run the whole database. Um, but at this point, this is where we are. So this is one of the solutions that is not as pretty or simple as I would like. It added a lot of steps to our workflow, but it does work. Uh, and probably my least favorite problem um, is that the EAD exports just stop after the file reaches a certain size. Um, this one's my least favorite mostly because we don't have a solution yet. Um, there's an open ticket for this one. Um, several more um, organizations and archivists have added um, information to this. Um, and so hopefully at some point, um, we will be able to fully get this issue resolved. Um, sort of as a stopgap, we've been able to um, break out some of the largest series and put them into their own resource so that it makes the re each resource smaller. Um, but for example, one of our series that we had to break out is all of the original paperwork for all of the laws ever signed in Maine, um, which is about, I think it's a little over 2000 boxes. Um, and we have it down to the folder level because each folder is a law um, and it doesn't like that much data in one um resource to create the EAD, it will just stop, um, which you get a semi-valid um, file out of that, but because it doesn't have the end tags, it won't let you do anything. With it. Um, so as I said, that's sort of my quick overview of some of the problems and solutions we've been working on. Um, so just sort of as a quick takeaway, um, Patience is required for all of this um, because of the size of the database, everything takes longer. Um, one good example I have of this is we have implemented the local context um, project, which allows us to um, put um, markers on any material that may contain indigenous information. Um, but it had plugin then will index anything below where you put the marker because it, it inherits it. Um, and it took three days to run and index everything below um, where we had placed those markers. I was in a panic. I didn't think it had worked for some reason. I thought it was a bug and it was just the fact that our collection was so large that it took several days to index. Um, thinking outside of the box, um, sometimes Obviously you have to go outside of archive space as a lot of the presenters have mentioned. Um, sometimes working with those large data sets it involves something like I use open refine um, to be able just to manage sometimes the doing things into CSV or Excel that it's just too big. It will either not open the file or it will crash or be very slow. So 
thinking outside the box, thinking of other tools you may be able to use just to get the data how you want it so that it's usable, especially for the non-tech savvy members of your organization, and then asking for help. Um, so obviously with the ticket, we had a lot of help from um, Lyrasis who hosts our install. Um, I've also asked several questions out on the listserv, which is great and you get good answers. And sometimes it's just nice to have other people who work maybe for your institution, maybe not, um, and be able to talk to them to see if they have similar problems. So is it, that's a quick overview for me. Um, but really a good part of this is I wanted to talk and see if anyone else is having similar issues and or other issues that are based on sort of the size of the collection um, and see and go from there. And, and this is my contact information in case anyone wants to reach out later. All right. Thank you, Kate. Um, there were several times where you <laughs> thousand eight thousand page finding aids, or then uh, the mention of um, a, a, a series that is all the paperwork for all of the laws ever signed in Maine. Uh, that is that is a lot. You you did not undersell it in your description. That's for sure. Um, so we're going to go ahead and move to the Q&A. So if you have a question for Kate, please do pop it into the Q&A. Um, we did get a question about these about these Q&As and if they would be made available with the recording. And we will make sure that each Q&A for every session is included on the wiki. So make sure you keep an eye out on the, uh, uh, for those resources in the coming weeks. Uh, so one question we have for Kate in the Q&A. Thank you for your presentation. Do you anticipate a future project to break up the collection into more resource records to make things less unwieldy? Um, I would say potentially um, when we had to do the first one with the laws um, that became sort of we talked about sort of the viability of that um, sort of our issue is that ours are structured as record groups which each represent a department in the state and so it is harder to break those up um, without losing the hierarchy that also exists not just in archival records but sort of in how we think about our records. Um, fortunately for the laws, that was a pretty easy one to separate out because that's meaningful sort of without its hierarchy. Um, and there's been another one which was a now defunct sort of function of our, our executive department called the executive council um, that we've had to separate out because it's gotten too large. But if it's something like air quality records, um, it sort of loses context if we break it out from its hierarchy. So there might be a few others, but our goal is not to have to do that um, because it's not ideal. Yep, thanks. Wow, the scale is just massive. Mm. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so if you have any more questions for Kate, please do drop them into the chat. Um, and I'll mention that the the ticket that Kate referenced, if anyone's interested in contributing comment on that, it's still, available. You can definitely include your use cases um, and that will be included as part of the, the resources on the, the yeah. wiki as well. All right. Um, no other questions are popping up into the chat. I'm going to speak very slowly to give it any last minute opportunities. Um, but barring none, I will say thank you so much, Kate. That was really interesting um, and overwhelming to hear about. So thank you so much for your presentation. Um, and thank you everyone for being here. Uh, not seeing any other questions popping up in the chat. And this is our last presentation for the day. So we're gonna go ahead and wrap up the first day of the virtual member forum. Thank you everyone for being here. Uh, and don't forget, we have another day of presentations tomorrow if you're interested in attending those registration is still open feel free to sign up at any time and we will send you connection information for that uh, otherwise i uh, will talk to you all tomorrow and i look forward to seeing you then thank you everyone